away last week. Some of us felt that way way back in the 60s. Whenever it was for you, you still can. It's not too late to change the world. Join the League of Women Voters and let us show you how. Everyone in this room should be a member of the League. Membership <laughs> information is available in the lobby or you can go to our website, lwvodc.org, to find more information about the League. We thank Senator Kinnaird and Commissioner Kerry for being here tonight. We thank you for putting in the time required to run for public office, for serving our community, and we thank you for changing our little world here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, um, Dolores Bailey from Empowerment. Good evening and thank you. I'm Dolores Bailey, Executive Director of Empowerment Incorporated, a 12-year-old nonprofit organization located here in Chapel Hill. We are the only nonprofit addressing affordable housing, economic development, and community organizing. It's because of our community organizing commitment that we are delighted to co-sponsor this event tonight. And though we don't endorse either of the candidates, we do encourage the people in the audience tonight and the listening audience to go out, register, and vote. Thank you. And one of the other co-sponsors, the Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Aaron Nelson. Thanks, I'm Aaron Nelson with the Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber of Commerce and rise only to give the briefest of welcomes on behalf of our board of directors and our 900 members. I won't pitch membership as hard as a previous speaker. <laughs> um, we just are, are thrilled. One of our missions is to help um, our members in the community ha get actionable information to help them make good decisions about themselves, their businesses, and their communities. So we're pleased to be here uh, sponsoring tonight. Um, we have an elections website at carolinachamber.org slash elections, and you'll find there information on, mostly on the upcoming county commissioner race and county commissioner responses to different questions. Um, but we're thrilled to be a part of this debate. Uh, we look forward to it. It's going to be very exciting. Thank you very much, Aaron, and to all of our, um, our co-sponsors. We have members of the media here tonight who will be asking the questions of Ms. Kinnaird and Mr. Carey. On the right, from 1360 WCHL, we have Natasha Vuklik. With the Chapel Hill News, we have Mei Ling Arun. I knew I was going to mess that up. Mei Ling Arunarat. With the Chapel Hill Herald, we have Mr. Neil Offen. And with the Daily, excuse me, the Carborough Citizen, we have Kirk Ross. With the Daily Tar Hill, Elizabeth D. O or Nelly. Did I get that right? Okay, I tried. We have, we will have um, the format for the debate this evening will be that we will alternate between Ms. Ms. Kinnaird and Mr. Carey. We will start with one and you'll have roughly about a minute to give an answer. And then we will follow with the uh, alternate candidate in about a minute. Then you will have 30 seconds to give a rebuttal, and both of you will have 30 seconds to give that rebuttal. I'd like to uh, read a little bit of background about uh, Ms. Kinnaird and also Mr. Carey. Senator Ellie Kinnaird has been involved in civic and community activities since 1962. She has devoted her political life to issues of social justice and the environment. In 1987, Ellie Kinnaird was elected mayor of Carborough, serving four terms. In 1996, she was elected to the North Carolina State Senate, where she is currently serving her sixth term, representing Orange and Person counties. She is co-chair of Mental Health and Youth, co-chair of Appropriations, Justice, and Public Safety, and vice chair of Agriculture, Environment, and Natural Resources. Senator Kinnaird holds a BA from Charlton College, an MM from UNC Chapel Hill, and a JD from North Carolina Central University School of Law. She is currently in private law practice. She's the mother of three sons and a grandmother to two lovely daughters and a delightful grandson. Senator Kinnaird is the recipient of numerous awards, including from the North Carolina Council of Churches, the Academy of Trial Lawyers, North Carolina Association of Women Attorneys, and recognition achievement by the Sierra Club. 
welcome Ms. Kinnaird. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And we have Moses Carey Jr. who grew up in Tampa, Florida and has resided in Chapel Hill since 1971. He spent most of his professional career in public health in Florida and, and in North Carolina. He earned his BS degree in health and physical education at Fort Valley State Administration at the University Fort Valley State College in Georgia, excuse me, in 1967. He also earned a master's degree in public health administration at the University of North Carolina School of Public Health in 1972 and a law degree at North Carolina Central University School of Law in 1980. He became a member of the NC State Bar in 1981. Moses has worked in local and state departments of health in Florida and served as executive director of Piedmont Health Services Incorporated for 18 years until he retired in December of 2004. Moses has worked for North Carolina Central University Department of Health Education since June 2005 under contract for the North Carolina Health and Wellness Trust Fund. He also served as an administrator and clinical assistant professor in the UNC School of Public Health, where he taught health law from 1981 to 1994. Moses was elected to the Orange County Board of County Commissioners in 1984 and is currently serving in his sixth term. He, would, he has served as chairman for 11, not consecutive years, but 11 years and currently serves in that position. He's currently a candidate for the North Carolina State Senate District 23. In 1993, he was elected by his peers to serve as the president of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. At that time, he became the first African American to serve as president for the association. Since then, he has he was selected in the 1998 as the Outstanding County Commissioner of the Year. He has served as president of the North Carolina Community Health Center Association in 1996, 1997, and again in 1999 and 2000, and has served on its board of directors from 1986 until 2004, when he left the employment of Piedmont Health Services Incorporated. Moses Carey is a member of the First Baptist Church and is married to Peggy A. Richmond and has four grown children and seven grandchildren. Welcome, Mr. Carey. Thank you for coming and participating in the debate this evening. As I welcome the candidates, I want to give them an opportunity to, at this point, make their opening statement, and then we will turn the questioning over to the um, panel of journalists, beginning with Kurt Ross. Ms. Kinnaird. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you very much to Empowerment, uh, the Chamber, the League of Women Voters, for uh, presenting this forum and to all of the audience for coming and working on it. I have been honored and privileged to serve the people of Orange and other counties uh, for a, a time when we have gone through many changes, and I have been an instrument of many of those changes. I've worked very hard on the environment, social justice, open government. You have a paper ballot and an audit thanks to my bills. You have one-stop voting thanks to my bills. We worked on many, many environmental issues, including pollution control, uh, hog waste lagoons, uh, and, and other areas such as um, open farmland. Uh, we were able to preserve farmland through tax advantage. Again, that was my bill that was the Orange County asked me to introduce. I have worked on death penalty issues, including getting a moratorium passed in the Senate and measures that went along with that that have drastically changed the way the death penalty is administered. I'm very interested in juvenile justice and very interested in continuing working in the environment, on social justice issues, and open government including uh, my uh, bill which uh, required that the employer employment be recorded when you uh, give money, and that's a very important open government feature. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm looking forward to the questions and uh, an open and robust debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Moses Carey. Thank you. I want to welcome you to what is perhaps the oldest and, and even maybe the only remaining, at least in this academic year, contact sport. 
<laughs> I, <laughs> I am Moses Kerr, and I'm asking for your vote uh, to fill this Senate seat in District 23. I'm asking for your support because I believe that my experience uh, in public service, which includes 24 years as an Orange County Commissioner in the most progressive county in the state, my experience in business as a business person, uh, CEO of Piedmont Health Services, which was an organization that had 100 employees when I became its director and 200 employees when I, res I uh, retired from uh, Piedmont Health Services. Uh, my experience in health, public health and my experience as a faculty member at UNC, uh, I'm seeking your support because I believe those experiences provides me with the background to be of great service to you in the North Carolina legislature. I'm also seeking your support because the most important thing perhaps in the legislature is the ability to develop relationships that allow one to develop uh, coalitions to get things done in the legislature. And I have developed relationships with uh, policymakers, including uh, state legislators and county commissioners across the state, that will help me to build those coalitions to get things done. I've been an advocate in many areas of local government and in state government for many years. In the area of health, public health, and access to health care, I've been a leader. I've been a champion for improving access to health care and health insurance because I think that if you don't have health insurance, you, people make uh, bad choices about their health because they are afraid that they won't be able to afford to pay for the service they need. I want to work on the, that issue when I get to the state and perhaps lend some support to improving the mental health debacle that we've experienced over the last few years. I also want to provide some leadership and to help move the uh, environmental conservation and uh, cultural conservation uh, uh, policies closer to what we can achieve in North Carolina. Orange County has been a leader in the area of cons environmental conservation and cultural conservation. And I want to take some of the things that I've learned as an Orange County Commissioner to Raleigh to try to help others see the importance of implementing some of those things at that level. But most important, I know that we're going to deal with issues that we can't anticipate at this time. And I pledge to you that I will consult you whenever an issue arises that will affect you. And I will do so in, to the best of my ability in a timely manner. So thank you for your sponsorship of this event tonight. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our views on various subjects with you that we uh, will do tonight. Mr. Kerry, thank you very much for that opening statement. Uh, just a rule that I did not cover, when we start going way over our time, uh, Adam's sitting in the front row and he'll, uh, he'll throw something at you, so be careful. <laughs> Actually, he'll uh, hold up a uh, white piece of paper and he'll give you an idea that uh, we need to start wrapping up so we can try to stay on time. Uh, now we'll turn it over to the uh, panel of journalists, beginning with Kurt Ross. Kurt? Uh, thanks to both of you for, for coming and, and to the, the sponsors for putting this thing on here. I think it's, it's really important that we, we have this discussion. Um, I want to start off with a, uh, I'm not looking for a laundry list here, but a, but a simple question. Um, should you prevail in, in May and uh, carry on and be uh, elected? What's at the very top of your list of things to do uh, in the legislature and how are you going to do it? To um, Ellie can hear. Okay. Thank you. Well, certainly the mental health crisis is at the top of the list. Uh, we have tried an experiment that was, from what I understand from the people who are knowledgeable in, in this business, uh, perhaps well conceived, but not carried out well. And uh, it not only wasn't carried out well, but it became um, much worse when the secretary decided to take away local control of crisis intervention, of screening, uh, and put it into a group called Value Options. The bill may be as high as 80 to a million to 180 million of money that they've wasted. I cannot tell you that 
I hear over and over again from families that are desperate, from people that are desperate, they have not been able to get help. They have not been able to uh, find the services that they need. We need to return it to the local control, to the uh, local management entities for screening, for crisis prevention, and for direct services so that we no longer have people who are without service and wasting t all this money and people without a job. Kirk, would you repeat the question? Um, should, you, should you win this election? Uh, what's at the very top of your list of things to accomplish, and how are you going to do it? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the most important things uh, will include uh, improving access to affordable health insurance and access to health care. Of course, mental health uh, parity is important among uh, those things, and I think the state took some strides in the last session to uh, improve parity for mental health uh, in the health insurance arena, but there's more work to be done. People that I speak with tell me that there are some loopholes that need to be closed in, in the bill that allowed the mental health parity to be, to be approved last year, and I will work to uh, close those, those holes to make sure that uh, the mental health needs of people are met. Uh, I also think that uh, th this, this, this drought that we experienced that uh, over the last year uh, should have stimulated the state to take more of a leadership role in conservation of our resources because if you don't have clean water, all growth will stop. And I think our greatest opportunity for uh, water resources and new water resources lies in conservation. And I think that uh, rather than having individual counties go to the state to ask permission to implement conservation, I see I've got the time, so I'll stop. <laughs> they, they don't have a little bill like they had yesterday. So they had a timer, and you knew. <laughs> Actually, these little rubber ducks, he said he was going to throw one up there, but I asked him oh. not to. Well, I already have one. So they, they don't hurt. <laughs> Senator Kinnaird, if you would like to um, uh, respond or expound upon uh, where you were headed with uh, your answer. Uh, I think those are the, the items that I am very much interested in. Uh, as far as health access is concerned, Verla Insco has a bill that would put a constitutional uh, requirement that health care is a right, just like education is a right. Uh, I'm going to work very hard. That's been there for four years, and it's time, I think, it's time has come because of the crisis. Certainly, the drought prevention, I'm going to introduce gray water use um, and lots of conservation measures. One of the problems is the state does not have control of water. It is strictly a local area, so it's going to be a big fight because the locals have even resisted going into regional uh, things and so what we've got to do is is shape a program that will have influence and effectiveness on the local level, but the state mandates. <coughs> Next question from Neil Offen with the Chapel Hill Herald. Do I get a? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. You you get a chance to rebut. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in in addition to the uh, items uh, of health care access and access to affordable health insurance that I mentioned earlier and taking the leadership at the state level for promoting, providing incentives for not only a water conservation but energy conservation, I think that one of the, one of the things we must realize is that we, we have a population in the state that's getting older. And I think that it's incumbent upon the state to begin now to planning to, for how they're going to address the needs of our elderly population. Uh, because many of us are going to be older. And I think it, there was an article published just recently that showed that uh, the state in Medicare and Medicaid spends between fifty dollars and $80,000 a year in the last two years of life for our elderly population. If we use preventive measures, we can do better than that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kerry. I didn't mean to be premature. Neil, if you would um, address the next question. This is for you, Commissioner Kerry. The North Carolina Center for Public Policy Research this week issued its annual rankings of effect effectiveness for members of the General Assembly. The center ranked Senator Kinnaird 27th in overall effectiveness. Do you think you would be more effective and why? Well, I think that, uh, I certainly think I can be more effective and uh, 
because I'm prepared to provide the leadership. I have the substantive background uh, in many areas, especially in the area of health care, to take the leadership role in, in, in the state Senate and in the state as a whole because I've had that experience. I have uh, the respect of my peers in the state, not only in the legislature, but in the public health profession and in the health, primary health care arena in the state that will provide me with the opportunity to provide a leadership role. And quite frankly, I, I will uh, certainly commit that if I'm not ranked m more than uh, lower than 27th by the third term, I, I will not seek reelection because I think that this process is about uh, seeking this seat to serve and to lead. And I just want to do that. That's why I'm seeking the seat. Neil, if you would uh, repeat the question for uh, Senator Kinnaird. Well, I'll adapt it slightly. Um, Senator Kinnaird, um, the North Carolina Center for Public Policy Research, uh, this week ranked you as the 27th most effective senator uh, in the General Assembly. Um, are you effective for Orange County, for your constituents? I am very effective. Uh, I gave you a list of the, some of the things that I had done that are particularly of interest to Orange County. That is to say, Orange County is a progressive county, and it expects its leaders to take on the tough issues, such as the death penalty moratorium, such as the paper ballot, such as the one-stop voting. And these are not go along to get along. <clears throat> and I can tell you that if you go along to get along, you will just kind of do it. Uh, and you will not make waves. But I think people in Orange County expect that we are going to take the tough issues and that we will work on the tough issues. Uh, my uh, leadership is very eager for me to, to return to work on those issues. They have told me that they respect and appreciate the fact that I take on those tough issues that hardly anybody else will take on. And they expect that I will continue to work on those. They're not the ones that get you in the front of the line, but they're certainly the ones that make good public policy that change the policy for the whole state of North Carolina in many profound ways. Mr. Carey, you have 30 seconds to rebut. Thank you. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> as one who uh, started the debate that resulted in Orange County having a social justice goal and the only county that has a social justice goal in, that we are aware of in the country at this point, I started that debate uh, in, 19, in, in 2002 because I felt that social justice, justice was important in this merger this, uh, discussion and debate that we had. Now, I was the only one out there who promoted uh, discussion, this, who promoted merger because I felt that it was a, a local government issue and local government had solved that. I didn't make friends because I started that debate and proposed merger. So as one who has taken on public, tough principle stands because it was the right thing to do, uh, I won't shy away from that when I go to Raleigh. Ms. Gennard, about 30 seconds to respond. I think one has to learn how to work with the legislature. And that is something that I have developed over the years. Um, I have been called the conscience of the Senate. And I believe that that is what exactly I have aimed to do, to take those issues that mean a lot to people but are not the easy issues. And the leadership has respected that for me uh, and, and are, as I say, have encouraged me to continue because they want someone who will bring up those issues and can get them through. They're not easy to get through, but I have been able to do every one of those and many, many more because I have persevered in the important principles that are morally right and help the whole state. Our next journalist, Mei Ling, with the Chapel Hill News. Senator Kinnaird, you had said that you had hoped a woman would succeed you in this next term. Do you really think a woman legislator is different from a male legislator, and how? Women look at things differently. Now, everybody is, has the potential to be a good legislator, a great legislator, or a bad legislator. I don't, I don't think that that has a gender uh, assignment. But what I have found in, in the legislature, especially this last term, 
is that the women look at things differently. The Women's Caucus works, uh, for instance, bipartisan basis. And we were able to get through, when I was chair of the Women's Caucus, wonderful uh, programs because we worked together. This last session, the women of the House sent over wonderful things, the mental health parity. Unfortunately, Blue Cross Blue Shield did get there and took out children's mental health and, and addiction. Uh, they sent over the minimum wage. They sent over the uh, earned income tax credit. Uh, and, and working together as a caucus, we are able to do that. They also look at the budget differently, and I'm going to give you a good example. I'm co-chair of Justice and Public Safety. When they had all men there as the chairs, uh, they built two more prisons, three more prisons. Since we have uh, two co-chairs who are women, we have changed so that we're hoping to get everything moved down to the prevention and intervention level and not build any more prisons. I think it's a different approach that women have. Mei Ling, I'm interested in how you turn that question around for Mr. Carey. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> delete that first part. Uh, Commissioner Moses uh, Carey, um, do you think a male legislator is different from a woman legislator and how? Well, I think everyone is there because they have different perspectives and they have different views and they come from different backgrounds and cultures. And I think we need a rich culture of people in the legislature so we can make the best policy we can from all of those views, collective views in the legislature. And I will say that uh, we, we, we need a, a good uh, array of women and African Americans and others in the state legislature and in the Senate. And I might add that uh, there are 51 women uh, running for the House, 10 of whom are unopposed at this time, and 18 women running for the Senate, one of whom is unopposed. So we're not going to have any scarcity of women uh, in the Senate. Uh, I'm not sure how many African Americans are running at this time, but I can assure you that none of them is running, if any, unopposed. Senator Kinnear. I think what we are looking at is a rich variety. I think uh, Mr. Moses is, Commissioner Moses is actually right, that what we want to do is have a representative. When I went in 12 years ago, there were seven women. There are seven now, and two have uh, sought higher office. It's very difficult for women to serve in the Senate. It's easier in the House because it's a smaller district. Uh, but it's very difficult for women. If you have a full-time job, you can't serve. If you have a two-family income, you can't, if you have young children. So it is a higher hurdle for women to, to get into the Senate than in the House. Commissioner Kerry, you have about 30 seconds for your response. Well, thank you. I, <clears throat> certainly, I think women have a challenge to get uh, elected in the House uh, and the Senate. And, uh, but we have to remember you know, that 40 or 50 years ago, there were no African Americans in the legislature at all. As a matter of fact, many African Americans were even denied the right to vote. So, you know, we've come a long way, and I don't think we need to be turning the clock back. And I want to help us continue the progressive leadership that Orange County has experienced, both at the county level and in the legislature. And, uh, and I certainly will pledge my commitment to doing that. From the Daily Tar Hill, Elizabeth. You've both spoke about the importance of taking on the tough issues, and so my question for you is, what's your strategy for combating the legal immigration issue that the entire state is facing, and how involved should local law enforcement be in enforcing immigration law, and how should local government treat the undocumented community? Oh, it, I, is this my start? Yes. Well, <clears throat> let, let me first uh, acknowledge that uh, immigration and enforcement of immigration is a federal law issue. It's a responsibility of the federal government to do that, not state government, not local government. But I will say that in Orange County, we work with the, the Sheriff Pendergraft to ensure that uh, when he arrests someone, he does not, the first thing he does is does not, uh, you know, haul them down and, and uh, take them to the immigration officials to see if they are uh, undocumented. I think that we have to recognize that, you know, we have a population of undocumented people here from um, other countries, um, most, of which, most of whom come from uh, Mexico, 
uh, who uh, provide the manpower and person power for uh, jobs that many of us here uh, either don't want or can't, can't perform. And I think that it would be an economic stress on our economy if we send them all back home. And I don't propose that we do that. I think we have to find, working with the federal and state government, uh, a way to accommodate the people who are here. That was a uh, multi-part question, so hopefully in your rebuttal what you can come back the with the rest thing? of it. She can repeat it. <laughs> can you repeat it for sure. uh, Senator Kinnaird? Um, I just wanted to know what your strategy was for combating illegal immigration and how involved do you think local law enforcement should be? I think he answered it. Um, <laughs> well, I, it, I agree it is a, a federal issue, but it very much impacts us. If anybody's heard, the, uh, the League of Women Voters had uh, Jim Johnson give, give a talk on the economic impact of uh, immigrants in, in our state, and, and uh, it is uh, something that we can't live without, frankly. You know, you aren't going to eat any um, any Kentucky Fried Chicken or or barbecue or or live in a house in North Raleigh or travel the streets without uh, in, encountering immigration and its impact on our our, our economy. Uh, one thing the state did that I was very much against, and that is that they decided to take away driver's licenses from illegal immigrants. Frankly, I want people. <laughs> who know the rules of the road, have taken a test, and have insurance on the road. And I think this was a political ploy to make people look really good, uh, because unfortunately this has turned into a sort of a national, let's jump on everybody issue, instead of saying, how can we solve this in a, in a, in a way? I agree that these, the sheriffs, uh, I, I commend Orange County for what you did on, on uh, instructing our sheriff. Of course, our sheriff's an elected official. He can decide what he wants to do. But I think it's reprehensible that these other counties uh, are, are, are putting people in, who aren't even convicted of anything in prison, in jail, and uh, asking later. Families are separated. It's terrible. Mr. Carey, rebuttal? Well, I think all of us uh read about the study, the economic impact study that Professor Johnson uh, did that uh, showed that uh, the uh, immigrant population in the state uh, is uh, contributing to the, the economy of the state and, uh, and they aren't costing uh, the state or the federal government as much money as some people portray them to be uh, costing the federal and state government. And I think that we have to acknowledge that. And I think that uh, when you consider that many of uh, the, the people who are here uh, who are undocumented uh, pay into a, a, a system, uh, especially a social security system, when they use uh, false social security numbers, they will never benefit from those, uh, from those, from those resources. The rest of us will. Sorry. Senator Kinnaird, your response. I think response is a better word than rebuttal. We seem to be agreeing on this uh, pretty strongly. Uh, I, I think that, that what the rest of the country is doing is not what we want to do in Orange County, and I'm very proud of us in Orange County. I wish the state would re look back on the driver's licenses. And by the way, the law says that these folks, are, these children, are allowed to go to the community colleges. Uh, unfortunately, the um, tuition for out-of-state is so high that they can't afford the community colleges. But, you know, we always talk about we well, like people who work hard, who want to do the best for their families and their children, but all of a sudden, they're not, they're, they're not the favored. They're the villains. And we know that these children could be com contributing to our economy and uh, our country, and I hope that they will rethink that. Senator Kinnaird, if I may ask a question. Do you, in your district, do you feel that um, what you've represented about um, immigration is the opinion, matches the opinion of the people that you've talked to in your district? I think so. Just about everybody I've talked to has felt that way. Now, I also have Person County, but Person County does not have a very large Hispanic uh, population. Uh, it's more concentrated here, and in, I used to have Randolph County that has, uh, in some schools, 40, 50 percent Hispanic children. Uh, I, I think that our schools are doing a wonderful job of really 
trying to uh, incorporate these children and, and welcome them. And I'm, again, I'm proud of our school systems for doing this. I'm proud of our county for what we are doing to welcome people who are contributing to our economy. And uh, will, if, the irony of it is that, that when the people come here, they can't get back, so they stay, and then they have children. And all those people who don't like Hispanics, presumably, are all of a sudden making a whole second generation of citizens. So figure that one out. Mr. Carey, in your district, uh, and there are a lot of varying opinions on this issue, uh, I, I, what have you heard? Well, I find that there are varying opinions, but I think that uh, the majority of the folk that uh, I encounter support the position the Orange County Board of Commissioners and the sheriff has, has taken. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, people feel strongly about uh, many things that they uh, feel are directly impacting them, and, uh, but I haven't heard many people in Orange County complain about the Latino and the undocumented population taking jobs away from them like I've heard in some other parts of this state. And, uh, and I think that uh, they're here to stay and we need to uh, adjust and deal with them in a, in a, a, a positive manner. Thank you very much. Uh, Natasha Vuclick with uh, 1360 WCHL. This question is for Senator Kinnaird and uh, Commissioner Kerry. How should the state handle repeat offenders? We've heard several law enforcement officials say that when repeat offenders are in jail, crime statistics go down, but when they're out on the streets, statistics increase. However, it seems that finding an effective way of dealing with repeat offenders has yet to be accomplished. So how would you approach the problem? Uh, the President Pro Tem called uh, a meeting of people to look at how the system is working or not working. And in particular, what we found was that none of the systems can talk to each other. Their computers can't talk to each other. That is to say, the clerk's office can't talk to the sheriff's office, they can't talk to the DA's office, they can't talk to the, to the judicial system. Uh, and what we've got to do is we have got to figure out and, and one of the things we're going to do um, is put about a half a million dollars and get SAS Institute over there to say, you know, if you can run all these other big corporations and, and, and uh, can, you, can you help us? And we're going to try to find that out because one of the things that we're not doing is keeping track of people. Now, as far as repeat offenders is concerned, the Department of Correction has a great deal of uh, programs, a great number of programs for offenders, but not enough. And the problem is that some of them get help, some of them get drug treatment, some of them get uh, education, but not enough, and we aren't keeping track of those people who are needing that, that oversight. Commissioner Carey? Well, uh, I, certainly I think that uh, we need to improve the management of people who have our previous offenders, uh, and we need to provide uh, the, the resources to ensure that we do what we can to provide them with services and the counseling to reduce recidivism and reduce the probability of them engaging in, in future crimes. Uh, I think that uh, a part of that is associated with the uh, debacle of the mental health system that we have experienced because uh, some of the people that have come out of prison and gone back in because they recruit, they've uh, repeated their offenses uh, have uh, substance abuse problems. And uh, if that problem is not sufficiently addressed before they come out, they're going to fall right back into the life, to a life of crime. So I think we need to provide the resources to not only uh, monitor and manage them after they get out, but to help them get back into society in a way that's going to allow them to be productive and make a contribution rather than scurry around trying to find a way to make a living. And they're going to do it whether it's legally or illegally. Uh, and the other thing that we need to do is engage in a bit of prevention. We need to put the juvenile back in the juvenile justice system because we need to prevent I'll stop there and come back to that. We uh, we don't have to slam on brakes when the when, when the when he holds the card up. I don't want him do to throw anything. To start at me. winding it down, <laughs> um, Senator Kinnaird. Forty percent of the people in our correctional system have serious mental health problems. Seventy percent in our juvenile, and that's exactly what we've got to deal with. And I I agree. We, prevention is what we've got to do. And in my uh, chairmanship. 
that is what we have emphasized, and we constantly work on the budget to try to say, we've got to put the money here in the prevention stage. There's a wonderful program that Durham has started, and there's modeling across the state, called a wraparound system of care, so that when a child presents a crisis, all of the forces come together instead of scatter, having the family scatter from the psychiatrist to the social worker to the court system. All of these come together in a team, and they wrap around the family and the child and keep that uh, child in services that will benefit him and stop him or her from becoming involved in the juvenile justice system. Commissioner Carey? Well, certainly, we, as I was about to say, we need to put the juvenile back in the juvenile justice system so that uh, ch children who are 16 and 17 year old don't get treated like uh, ad adults because they're mentally in their mind, they haven't developed as adults. So we need to do a better job of providing the support for them uh, and keeping them out of the adult criminal system before why they're 17 and 18 years old. That's one way of engaging in prevention, but I also think we need to engage in prevention by paying and investing in early childhood education for children before they even get to school because many of their patterns are developed at uh, very early age and if they get the support and nurturing they need in, <clears throat> in their early years, I think that's perhaps the best way to invest in preventing children from falling into a life of crime. We also need to provide support for the families of children who have problems in the early childhood development years. With both of you talking about putting the juvenile back in juvenile um, system and <clears throat> prevention, are either of you concerned about appearing soft on crime? <laughs> not in Orange County. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not a, a, a concerned about that anywhere because I think it's the right thing to do and given the chance I will convince others outside of Orange County to invest more in early childhood education and prevention and in and I will work to uh, convince others outside of Orange County that it's a good investment uh, to uh, prevent recidivism by investing in uh, keeping children out of the adult system. It's just a good investment and you have to speak with to people in a the language they understand and most legislators understand investment. They, this is like the, they just like the dividends to come in in their term in two years, but it just doesn't do that. Investments takes longer for the dividends to, to, to return. Um, I have introduced a bill to, uh, along with Alice Bordson in Burlington and uh, Alamance County, to change the age of juvenile from 16 to 18. It is currently in a study commission and we are working on that. I'm chair of that committee. Uh, it will take a long time. It will take a couple of years of study and preparation. But we're hoping to thread that into our new juvenile justice system, which I've been working for, which is a therapeutic system where we uh, take small groups of children. They will be in pods of no more than eight and the whole unit will have no more than 32. And each person who works there, from the cook through the director, will be trained in the therapeutic model in relating to these children. We feel that we can greatly reduce those children who are becoming violent or becoming part of the adult system by meeting that at that very early age. And as uh, Dur Durham has found out with their wraparound system of care, they have reduced children in the uh, juvenile justice system by 50%. And that is a dramatic prevention program, and we know that we can do that. Uh, I've been working on that for about four years, and I, I'm very pleased that we are now moving forward on it, and I think it will come to fruition in a couple of years. Thank you all for answering that. I was getting a little, little jealous over here. I didn't get to ask any <laughs> questions. <laughs> Kirk? I believe this is for, uh, we start with Moses on this one. Kirk with the Carborough Citizen. Um, thank you. Uh, to balance the budget during, um, during the stretch of tight budget years, uh, state employees saw wage freezes, higher health care costs, and retirement rule changes. Uh, the state employee health care system gets more expensive every year. A lot of employees are worried as well about the future of the state pension system. What can be done to get state workers a fair shake from the legislature? 
Well, <clears throat> I certainly think that uh, one of the worst things we can do, and it's short-sighted to begin to retrench on uh, the health insurance that uh, state employees have. I think that the state should pay the entire cost of every employee's health insurance. We do that in Orange County, and I think the state should do the same, and I think the state should not uh, begin to retrench on uh, uh, the health insurance for employees by increasing deductibles to the point where the employee's salary increase is consumed entirely by the cost of the deductible. Uh, that, that's short-sighted. Uh, because my background is public health, and I think that you have to provide uh, opportunities for people to improve their health by going to medical providers when they need it, rather than by putting it off because they're afraid that it's going to cost them or their families uh, outrageous uh, amounts of money. I, I think the state has to have the intestinal fortitude to do what it needs to do to raise revenue to cover the costs of operating state programs, including paying for health uh, state employee health insurance, and I will not support retrenching on uh, the, the, the health insurance that state employees have simply because uh, I want to shy away from raising revenue, uh, i.e. tax increases, because that's not uh, taking a long-term view, and I think one of the things we need to change in this state is the fact that we want to invest, but we want the return to uh, come in during our two-year term, and it just doesn't happen like that. It takes longer for dividends to come in and show up when you're investing in things like health care and early childhood education and reducing recidivism. Thank you, Commissioner Kerry. Senator Kinnaird. Thank you. Uh, one of the goals of the state employees is to engage in collective bargaining with the state. Now, this doesn't mean they can go out on strike. It just simply means that they can sit down. What's happened in the budget in the past, and I have been fighting this for years, is that uh, we write the budget and then we say, are there any crumbs left over for state employees? And I've been saying for years, we need to start up a front. What are we going to do for state employees? I'm hoping, I introduced a bill uh, four years ago, and we'll be introducing it again if I'm reelected, to allow collective bargaining so that they can start at the front of the budget. Uh, rather than at the end. I uh, also worked uh, some years ago with uh, the UNC employees on what we could do on the state health plan. And what's happened to the state health plan is there are lots of retirees. That's you and me. And we cost a lot more. But what it has done is it's put it on the back of the dependents. Dependent health insurance for our state employees is prohibitive. And when you're making uh, the, at, at a little bit above poverty level, which unfortunately many of our employees are, you cannot afford your dependent insurance, and many of them have to take a second job in order to pay for that. I want to concentrate on helping these families get good coverage for their children as well as themselves. Commissioner Carey, additional commentary? Yes. Uh, I commented earlier about the fact that um, many of the dollars we spend in Medicare and Medicaid is spent in the last two years of life in, in, in this country and in this state. And by the time, by the year 2050, 25, 20 percent of the population in the U.S. will be 65 or older. And by the year 2030, 2.2 uh, million of North Carolina's population will be 65 years of age or older. If we engage in the kind of prevention that I know that we can implement, we will save money. We won't have to be retrenching on uh, the, the health insurance for people who are state employees. Uh, because when you consider that, uh, you know, falls is the greatest contributor to the expense of the Medicare program, and when you also consider that 25 percent of the seniors who fall and have hip fractures die within six months of that time, if we implement a program we can reduce the number of falls, thereby reducing the number of people who are 65 or older who have to go into the hospital and save the state and the federal government a lot of money that we can use for other things. Additional response, Senator Kinnaird. Yes, thank you. Uh, four years ago, uh, I began urging uh, the uh, Senator Rand, who's 
the person who has been dealing most closely with the state health plan, to start negotiating with other states for lower cost pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have engaged that. We now have, I think it's a four to five state buying consortium, and we have been able to greatly reduce the cost of our pharmaceuticals as a result of that. And the state is a big buyer of pharmaceuticals. It's the Department of Correction, which has very high costs because they have HIV and, um, and uh, uh, things such as psychotropic drugs. It's the state health plan. Uh, it's Medicaid. So they have big costs, and so we have been able to. But what this country has got to do is reduce, is somehow come to terms with the whole pharmaceutical industry. And finally, I would like to say that uh, Verlinsko has a, uh, a, a universal health plan in that I hope we will pass very soon. We have time for one more question before we have to take a break. Uh, Neil Offen with the Chapel Hill Herald. Senator Knarrett, as you know, um, housing costs in Orange County are very expensive and becoming increasingly so. We heard today at the annual report on the county economy that a single-family house in Orange County costs on average more than $240,000, more than a similar home in Durham County. What can the General Assembly do to create more affordable housing here? One of the measures which we have proposed and would like to get passed uh, is inclusionary zoning, where we have the ability to require a certain number of low-income housing or workforce housing in any given development. Uh, the Home Builders Association is a very powerful lobby, uh, and what we have been working for is to try to get a coalition throughout the state that would work with us to try to get that through. Uh, one of the things that I'm very glad happened last year, by the way, is our lobbying bill, which I was uh, co-sponsor of, along with Senator Rand, which uh, means that there, we've changed the way people get money when they run for office, and I'm hoping that that's gonna make a difference and that uh, legislators will be less reliant on the lobbyist and the special interests and be able to work more now for the actual good of the people. And I'm, I'm optimistic that we may be able to get our inclusionary zoning through soon. Senator Kerry. Oh, excuse <coughs> well, me, Commissioner Kerry. <laughs> Thank you, I resemble that comment. <laughs> uh, I, I think one of the things the legislature can do is to increase the funding for the affordable housing trust fund so that local governments can be incentivized to work with private groups to uh, help more affordable housing be developed all over the state, not just in, in, in Orange County, but all over the state. And one of the best ways to get more money into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is to, uh, 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 for the legislature to do things that uh, allow voters to own elections. We, we need to move further in the direction of voter-owned elections so that we reduce the impact of, uh, of, of money on, on elections. And uh, that's also true uh, when, you, when it comes to trying to find ways to uh, re reduce the cost of pharmaceuticals and reduce the cost of many other things that uh, government has to pay for because, you know, we, we can do better. And I think uh, have, by having voter-owned elections uh, to reduce uh, the cost uh, uh, to reduce the impact of money on elections, we will be able to achieve some of the things that are important public policy initiative for the state. Senator Kinnaird, if you'd like to respond. Yes, I'm very happy that the legislature last year extended the publicly financed elections down to the auditor and the school superintendent and um, trying to think what the third one is. Uh, and so this is a step in the right direction. Of course, our ultimate goal is the legislature, because then we really will not be so influenced by, um, by the lobbyists and the special interests. And it's worked well with the judicial uh, el elections, and I'm very pleased with that, and I'm hoping that we will eventually get it all the way down to the legislature. And your response, Mr. Carey? Uh, well, let me say that... Uh, it, it is important for uh, the legislature to take actions to re reduce the impact of money on elections and make uh, running for office more affordable to more people 
in this state. We have many people who have very good ideas, but they're not economically able to run, uh, and, uh, and we need to remove that barrier to having the kind of diversified legislature that we all know will produce better public policy. Commissioner Kerry, Senator Kinnear, thank you very much. Uh, when we come back, we'll take about a five minute break. And when we come back, we will entertain some questions from the audience here at, uh, at Town That's Hall. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have to take a break, but we will be back in a few minutes it's with the audience me. participation part of the debate. Oh, I'm your host, Walter Sturdivant, and you're listening to the Senatorial Debate live on 1360 WCHL. They need some commercials. That's yeah, right. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the 2008 Senatorial Debate broadcast live on 1360 WCHL. The debate tonight is sponsored by Empowerment Incorporated, the League of Women Voters, the Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber of Commerce, and 1360 WCHL. I'm Walter Sturdivant, the general manager of WCHL, and I'm happy to be here with our esteemed senatorial candidates, Commissioner Moses Carey and Senator Ellie Kinnaird. I told just a small fib before the break. I said we would go directly to audience questions. We have three um, journalists who did not get in their <laughs> second question. We will try to do that quickly, and then we'll go to um, some questions from the audience. I think next up was Mei Ling from the <laughs> Chapel Hill News, if you would like to address <coughs> a question to one of the senators, okay. one of the candidates. Um, do you think uh, the Triangle will ever get a more commuter-friendly public <coughs> transit system? Well, I, I think we will, uh, and, uh, and I think it may not be as, as close in the future as we would like to see it because uh, the discussions that are going on now are, are, are far from finding a way to pay for it. I do think the state and the federal government are going to have to uh, provide some support if we're going to develop, develop a more commuter-friendly uh, transportation system uh, in this triangle area. Uh, you know, we, we, we wait until it hurts in order to do the right thing, and I think that uh, with the rate gas prices are going up, we're going to be hurting enough for people to want to get out of cars and take public transit, and that just may be the thing that uh, provides the incentive for us to work harder at trying to find a way to pay for it because uh, under current rules, most of the money that is going to have to pay for it is going to have to come from us, he, people who live in this area, and, uh, but the public is not ready to do that as yet. I'll repeat the question. Uh, oh, uh, do you? <laughs> yeah, if I okay. may. Um, Actually, I think 90% of it comes from the federal government, and the best way for us to get our rail is to elect a Democratic Congress and President next session. <clears throat> because, of course, we had uh, the uh, Triangle Transit Authority and, and the, uh, the uh, Triangle communities were working on a rail, a light rail, uh, when uh, Senator Dole refused to help us out. Uh, one of the things that, that has changed in the plan that I think is very good. When they originally planned the light rail, it did not go to either Chapel Hill or the airport, which was very short-sighted. Uh, the new plan does go to both Chapel Hill and the airport, and they are going to prepare a new uh, proposal to the federal government to try to get the light rail in. We have the best bus system in the United States. It is free, it is frequent, and it is very responsive to the needs of the students. <laughs> but I can tell you that some working people have a difficult time because during the holidays and vacations when the students aren't here, they don't run all those. And I was talking with a woman who was a maid at a hotel. She lived in Carborough. She, lived, she worked at the Holiday Inn across town. And when the students went on break, she couldn't get to work except by a taxi on time. So we've got to make some adjustments in our local, and I'm hoping that the new federal government will help us out with the light rail. Commissioner Carey, your response. Well, obviously, the uh, federal government and transportation funds will have to play a role, as I stated earlier, and uh, new leadership in Washington will help. But I'm not going to hold my breath until we get uh, help from Washington. I think we have to take the initiative to do some things for ourselves here in the state of North Carolina, and that includes moving the needle forward on uh, providing universal health care and health insurance for people who live in this state. You've heard the federal candidates for president talk about their, their plans, but I'm not convinced that even if they're elected, they're going to be able to move those forward. We can, take, we can learn something from states like Massachusetts, uh, Oregon, California and others who have uh, tried to implement uh, universal health insurance and improve health access to health care. We can learn from their mistakes and develop it for ourselves as well as in health care and transportation. Senator Kinnaird, please give us your brief uh, additional commentary. 
Well, I think what I said was pretty accurate, that, that it is a, the light rail is a very, very expensive system, and we've got to have a new government in, in Washington before we can do that. We are prepared and ready to go ahead. The municipalities and, uh, and the TTA, the Triangle Transit Authority, have a plan in place, and uh, if we uh, replace Dole, I think that we have a much better chance of getting that because we'll have someone who will advocate for us. From the Daily Tar Hill, Elizabeth Diornelli. I'm getting hey. better, aren't I? Um, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of agreement tonight, um, both on the issues and on your priorities. And so I was hoping you could more clearly lay out for us exactly what sets you apart from your opponent in this election. Well, I'll be happy to respond to that. I, I am the only uh, candidate in this primary election who has 24 years of public service in elective office. I am the only candidate who has 18 years of business experience as a CEO and has had to balance a budget and uh, make sure that uh, 100 employees when I took over Piedmont Health Services and 200 employees when I uh, left Piedmont Health Services had paychecks every two weeks. Uh, I am the only candidate in this race who has uh, in, increased the number of people who received primary care regardless of their ability to pay from uh, about 13 to 15,000 in 1986 to uh, over 31,000 people receiving primary health care without regard to their ability to pay uh, or their insurance status uh, in 2004 when I left Piedmont Health Services. I am the only candidate in this race who's lived through the development of conservation measures at the county level and provided opportunities for farmers to preserve their farmland by purchasing easements uh, <clears throat> from them uh, so that they can stay on their farm and don't have to worry about converting their farm to the next crop of condominiums. Uh, and uh, those are the things that make me different and those are the things that have prepared me to serve this district well in the state senate senator canary thank you i have a respected record and achievements and accomplishments that i can build on for carrying forward all of those i know that i can help because i have formed coalitions within the leadership as well as the membership I work well with all of my fellow members, and as I say, I'm respected because they know that I will put forward those issues that are very important, not only to Orange County, but to the entire state. I will continue to work on environmental issues, such as the protection of farmland, which came out of Orange County. I'm responsive to what our county and what our municipalities ask us to do, and yet I take leadership on issues that are broadly uh, impacting the state. I know that I can make a difference, I have made a difference, and I can continue to make a difference with all of those of my fellow legislators working with them and working with my constituents who are the best constituents in the state. Couldn't have any better constituents. Best values, best goals, best issues. Mr. Kerry, please give us your additional commentary. Well, uh, again, uh, I believe that I can serve this district well because one of the things that uh, is required uh, in the legislature in order to get things done is to the ability to build alliances and convince people to listen to you long enough for you to be able to convince them that they should move in a certain policy direction. I've developed those relationships with legislators across the state. I've developed those, those relationships with many people across the state, especially in the public health and community health arena. Uh, I have had working relationships with county commissioners across the state as uh, president of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, and, and I am the person who uh, organized the uh, alliance of North Carolina black elected officials, which includes all of the black elected officials in the state, and I'm currently president of that organization. Ms. Kinnaird, do you have additional commentary? 
Uh, I don't know that there is any additional. I think we both said the same thing. We will work for alliances. Um, I was president of the uh, chair of the Women's Caucus. I have been working very strongly with a group of progressives who have taken these measures and carried them forward to the leadership. Uh, this is a very effective group of progressive people in, in the Senate. Uh, we all luckily sit on one side. I, th I think they maybe made a mistake when they put us all on one side. But nevertheless, we have formed a core group of progressives who are able to go to the leadership and make sure that they are doing what we feel is the right thing. And we have been successful. Last session was the most progressive in the 12 years I have been there because of our very progressive core group. With the last question from our media panel, Natasha Vuklik with 1360 WCHL. This is a question for both of you. Sex trafficking is said to be one of the world's largest international crimes. Do you think sex trafficking is a problem locally and statewide? If so, what would you do to stop it? Some years ago, I was privileged to attend a conference in uh, Washington. It was a Women's Policy Research Institute for women legislators, and they introduced us to national and international issues. Out of that came an interest in sex trafficking, and actually it's human trafficking, it's not just sex trafficking, although the, the conference this weekend was concentrating on sex trafficking. I came back determined that we would find a solution in our state, because while each of us said, oh, it didn't happen in our state, we were shocked to find it happened in every state. And actually, uh, 95 is, uh, and, and 85 are major sex trafficking and, and human trafficking corridors. So uh, I introduced and was able to pass a bill that makes it a criminal offense, and the criminal penalties are set out, modeled after the federal offense. The reason is that when we had our study commission, they told us that they couldn't enforce the federal on a state level. This last year, we passed my bill for the benefits for the services to those human traffic victims. Commissioner Moses Carey. Well, uh, I think that human trafficking, of which uh, sex trafficking is a part, uh, is is a problem, and uh, and I think the state can play a role in trying to help address uh, that issue. And one of the ways the state can play a role is to work more closely with local government officials, which is where the rubber actually hits the road, because uh, it takes a partnership between state and local government to make any program or any initiative work. And that is especially true in areas like uh, sex or human trafficking, uh, it is also important that the state and local government work together very well in trying to solve and, and rebuild this uh, mental health debacle that we've experienced because one of the things that contributed to the debacle of the mental health uh, system is the state uh, not recognizing the role that local operators and local programs played and making sure that the services were available and of the quality that people needed when they needed the service. And, uh, and that's one of the things I want to work on when I go to the state, to try to rebuild the relationship between state and local government, because state, it's important for state to be regulators, but it's imp also important for local government and local programs to be quality operators. Senator Kinnaird, um, anything to add? Yes, definitely. Uh, Trafficking is very difficult because it's sporadic and geographically dispersed. So one of the things that we have set out, and we've actually got the manual from the Law Enforcement Training Institution, uh, Justice Institute, is a uh, training program for local law enforcement, and that includes state troopers, because they've got to be able to recognize it, and they've got to be trained, and we're setting that out next year. We're getting the funding for the actual training, but the Women's Center has gotten, and the Justice Center has gotten a, a grants to start that training and they are starting across the state. The second thing is you've got to have services because when a, a victim is uh, recognized and identified, they've got to have a place to stay, they've got to have sustenance for the time that it takes to get their legal status because they are not illegal immigrants, they are crime victims. And that's the most difficult thing because it can take months to get their, their legal status so that they can stay in the United States. 
Mr. Carey? I, I don't have anything else to contribute <clears throat> on that. <laughs> In that case, we will, um, if I can get my glasses on, we will go to um, a couple questions from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, we've thanked everyone else this evening, but we did not thank the people who showed up here at Town Hall to, um, to participate and to listen. Thank you all for being here, and thanks for your questions. The uh, first question from the audience, and I will address this initially to uh, Mr. Moses Carey. Will you introduce and vote for legislation to compel merger of the two school systems in Orange County? Why or why not? I was wondering how long that question was. Yeah, worked. me too. Okay. <laughs> but I, I started the debate in 2002 on the issue of school merger because I thought there was a social justice issue associated with one school system having $12 million more to provide education for its children than the other school system. Uh, I also started that debate in 2002 because I felt that it was the responsibility of local government officials to uh, address issues of inequity and, uh, and equity. And I also think that Emerging school systems is uniquely within the domain of local county commissioners and local school boards. And uh, consequently, I took the principled position of, of trying to uh, stimulate the debate on merger in 2002. Uh, when I'm in Raleigh, uh, I will oppose any attempt to merge schools from the state level because I think that's a usurpation of local government responsibility, and I am adamant that the state should not use a one-size-fit-all approach to trying to address local issues that local government officials should be uh, addressing. So uh, I, I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do, and everyone told me that that was the end of my political career for raising that issue, but uh, we needed that debate, and, uh, but I will oppose any effort at the state level to merge schools. Senator Kinnaird, will you introduce and vote for legislation to compel merger of the two school systems in Orange County? Why or why not? Uh, your delegation, which is Verla Insko and Joe Hackney and I, have fought that off every year because there are people who want to do that. They say it'll save money, but it's not much money. It's, I think, $14 million, $12 million. Uh, the reason that some ha have raised this issue and it's a valid point, is that there are two systems in the state that are actually segregated. And the, the aim was to try to integrate that. And of course, we saw that in Durham. It was successful in Durham, some people think. I, I can't comment on that. But what we've got to make sure is that if it works because it was a matter of segregated schools, that's fine. But when you have a, a county such as Orange, that has two systems that have spoken loudly <laughs> in that last uh, referendum that they do not want to be merged, and they seem to be satisfied with the type of uh, a, a product that they have, then I think we have to listen to that. We do have to make sure that the schools are both uh, funded at, at a level that is equal and fair and adequate. Mr. Kerry, anything further to add about uh, Well, yes, uh, just a little clarification. We have not had a referendum on the issue of merger in, no, the in Orange County. And uh, the, the county schools did vote and vote down uh, a, 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 a school tax uh, in the Orange County system. But I can assure you that the issue of equity uh, is not going away simply because we're not debating it anymore. Uh, when I raised the issue of merger and uh, 2002, the differences in funding for the two school systems was $12 million. Uh, I would submit that this year the differences in funding for the two school systems is closer to 14 or $15 million. And, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, I will not support any effort at the state level to merge local school boards because that's it, that is uniquely a local government responsibility and that should be left to the voters and the elected officials at the local level. And that the question came from the audience that the uh, issue is probably not going away. Uh, <laughs> Senator Kinnear. I don't know if we're going to, in the interest of time, do you really want us to go back and forth on every single question or is, is one answer? Only if you feel that you have something well, additional I, to say. I think I agree with, with him and I will work very hard as I have in the past. So I'm, I'm not sure that we need to. 
necessarily go back and forth over and over. In that case, next question for Senator Kinnaird. What action will you personally take to increase the commercial tax base in Orange County? Well, I'm in the legislature. <laughs> Um, I'm very pleased what has happened in, in that they have uh, been working to increase the commercial tax base in Orange County, the county commissioners, and, and uh, uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is fight off all these incentives for these big corporations like Dell and, and uh, whatnot because we have to pay that tax ourselves as individuals because they're not collecting it from them. And uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, I think there are four uh, big corporations that have been given incentives and had to renege on them. Uh, so I think we need to look at our entire tax base. We do not have a fair tax base at this point. Uh, the people at the lowest income pay a much higher proportion of their uh, income in taxes. And so what we've got to do is revamp the entire tax structure and uh, stop shoving so much over on the middle and lower class in the way of taxes. And that's what's been happening for the last 12 years. Um, Commissioner well, Carey? Yes, uh, as an Orange County Commissioner in this progressive county for the last 24 years, I think the Orange County Board of Commissioners has done what it could to promote uh, uh, economic development in the economic development districts, which is the only area that the county has for uh, economic development and commercial development to locate. We've provided the rules and regulations to uh, make the process uh, fairer and uh, to help developers understand what the rules are. One of the other things that I would like to do when I get to Raleigh is to provide opportunities for local governments to get infrastructure money to develop uh, the infrastructure because one of the reasons uh, development doesn't go into areas that are uh, that are poorer and that uh, that lack infrastructure is because it you, it requires uh, some type of infrastructure in order for development to to locate there, and uh, and that has been one of the issues associated with our economic development districts. They, we needed public water and sewer out there. We finally got it out at Buckhorn Road, uh, in the western part of the the county, and uh, and so there's potential for something to happen out there that will contribute to improving the tax base, uh, the balance in the tax space between residential and commercial development, because everyone recognizes that. Uh, residential development doesn't pay for itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a net loser, and we need to have more commercial uh, 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 development in Orange County to improve that base, that balance. I am going <laughs> to respond to this one. Um, we have passed in, in uh, the last, I'd say, 15 years, uh, water sewer bonds, uh, as well as um, uh, clean water trust management funds. The water sewer almost always goes to what are a lower, a different tier. We're in a high tier, which means that we have a lot of money. And if you go down east, they have a high unemployment and a very uh, poor economy. So we have not av been able to get any of those water sewer bonds. <clears throat> and even if they pass another one, they're talking about another billion, <clears throat> excuse me, next year we probably would not get it. A clean water uh, management trust fund, however, we have gotten a lot of money for, but it's been for open space rather than infrastructure. And that probably will be the pattern that would continue because we are economically vibrant. Thank you. While we have had tremendous amounts of fun this evening, we have time for about one more question. So I'm going to address that uh, initial question to Commissioner Carey, the last question rather. If passed, how would a constitutional amendment guaranteeing health care for all be implemented? Please be specific. Well, I think that uh, a constitutional amendment guaranteeing health care can only be implemented with a partnership between state and local government and uh, to some extent the federal government because uh, the, the health system is, is very complex and it requires the services to be, be delivered at the local level while the payment for the services uh, will uh, come from uh, the state and federal government. Uh, we have an incremental uh, system now with Medicaid and Medicare that provides coverage for many people but it leaves out many vulnerable populations. 
And uh, a constitutional amendment will uh, ensure that at least the government, both state, federal, and local, and if it's a state constitutional amendment, state government primarily, has a responsibility for ensuring that the services are delivered. And that means that uh, we'll have to figure out a way to pay for them. But I think that there's enough money in the system now if we focus on prevention and investing more in prevention, uh, which most health insurance plans don't do now, there's enough money in the system to provide coverage for just about everybody who needs care. And when you consider that uh, when people show up at hospitals now, they get served. Well, even if they don't have health insurance, they get served. So somebody pays for that. It's not free. We have a universal system now of the worst kind because it provides perverse incentives for transferring costs from people who have insurance to people who don't. Senator Kinnaird, if you would address that, would you like for me to uh, re, re, restate no, I, the question? I, I've got that. Okay. Uh, Twelve years ago, uh, Pam Silverman at the, at the, I believe, at the Institute of, Govern of uh, Medicine did a study that showed that for the amount that we spend on indig indigent care, people going to the emergency rooms when they could have a regular doctor, uh, and uh, the uh, poor health results, uh, we could pay for every single person in the state of North Carolina, much like we do the state health plan. Uh, what we've got to do is set up a system of primary care. Uh, we have a, a Medicare system that works that way now. Every person would be assigned a primary care uh, physician or physician's assistant. And that would be a regular, ongoing relationship. And within that system, we can pay for everybody to do that. And I think that's got to be our goal, is that we've got to make sure that we... <coughs> Start at the beginning instead of at the end. Then we've got to work with the insurance companies. Frankly, I think the insurance companies got to get out of this business. Medicare has a 3% administration cost, and private insurance have a 16%. We also have to start saying to the pharmaceutical companies, you don't have free reign in this country anymore. We can start with that on a state level and start with both of those. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank, uh, I would like to thank uh, Senator Kinnaird, Senator Ellie Kinnaird, Commissioner Moses Carey. If you would, please give them a hand for um, participating. Got a nice sticker. Don't go anywhere with that. The debate tonight has been sponsored by Empowerment Incorporated, the League of Women Voters, the Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber of Commerce, and 1360 WCHL. I'm Walter Sturdivant, the general manager of WCHL, and I'd like to thank you for coming out, all of the people in the, um, in the audience here at Town Hall. Thank you to the, um, to the Chapel Hill, uh, town of Chapel Hill for allowing us to utilize this facility. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in to 1360 WCHL, and most of all, Thank you to our fine candidates, Ms. Ellie Kinnaird and Mr. Moses Carey. You are listening to News Talk 1360 WCHL.